we start off in a non-suspicious way. A young boy stares at a map of Tokyo, trying to figure out which way to go to reach his destination. While he's plotting out his course, he's distracted by three girls talking. They're really flashy, he thinks, and unbeknownst to him, the girls noticed him too. One of them comments that the kid's really cute, and they start debating whether he's a boy or a girl. And just so we're clear on this, he's a boy. A very young boy. He then approaches a woman carrying crates and manning the liquor store. When he asks for directions to Sunahara House, the woman happily helps him out before asking if he's moving there. And he is. His name is Shina Aki. And the woman lovingly calls him Aki-chan. As the boy goes on his merry way, the woman says to herself that Aki's a cute kid. Ayaka will definitely be happy. Hmm. Meanwhile, Aki's thinking about why he's moving to the Sunahara House in the first place. He decided to go to a middle school far away from home to start anew. Because of his androgynous features, he wasn't treated as a guy back home. But now that he's in Tokyo, it's time for him to live like a man. To my middle school debut! He shouts, raising a fist in the air. The sunny day then changes to a dark atmosphere with the rain pouring hard. Immediately, Aki is instantly soaked. Not to rain on your parade, Aki, but that's not a very good omen for your middle school debut. Well, I guess now Aki knows that too. Ah, the poor kid. When the skies start to clear up, he finally arrives at the Sunahara house. There, he meets the colossal Tatas of the house's caretaker, Sunahara Ayaka. She greets him, but little Aki seems to be spacing out, a little flustered too. Since he isn't saying anything, she thinks that he isn't the new tenant, but whatever. She still takes Aki in her mm, arms and declares that she can't just leave a girl to catch a cold. So much for living like a man. Well, then again, with Aki's close proximity to a beauty like Ayaka, he seems to be living better than a lot of men out there. While he sits in the tub, Aki relaxes for approximately 0.5 seconds before freaking out about the situation. He didn't know that there was going to be a pretty lady in the place he will be staying at. And if she's the caretaker, that means they'll be under one roof for three years. The boy's almost catatonic at the thought. And to make matters worse, Ayaka makes her bathtub scene debut. She struts in scantily clad and invites herself in to wash his back. The lady mentions that it's tradition for the caretaker to wash the new resident's back. And apparently her grandma's the real caretaker. But since she's hospitalized, it's now Ayaka's job to do it. Now imagine the grandma rubbing their backs every time. Oh, and by the way, the caretaker is still operating under the misconception that Aki is a girl. So she doesn't know why Aki's so worried at the idea of her washing his back. They're both girls, so what's the problem, right? Now, as he's sitting, waiting for his back to be washed, Angel Aki and Demon Aki appear. Demon Aki says that he should just let her wash his back. When else is he gonna experience that? Angel Aki rebuts that he should tell her, since he can only truly become a man by showing that he is one. So instead of arguing, the two Akis agree to work together. So Aki tries to tell Ayaka, but him being a boy doesn't seem to bother Ayaka since, according to her, he's just a kid. This means that she has to take care of him, she says as she playfully bites his ear. That KO'd Aki. He passes out from the shock while Ayaka's still somewhere there and not in the gallows. What are you doing, woman? When he regains consciousness, he's out of the bath and laying on her lap with his clothes on. Ayaka says, you really are a boy, aren't you? Since your face and name seemed feminine, I totally mistook you for a girl. Oh, so she's seen his... <laughs> his, um... <laughs> ding, ding, dong. So Aki is absolutely embarrassed by this, but Ayaka tells him not to worry since his size is... perfectly normal for his age. After that, she's off to prepare supper. Ayaka's good at everything she does and is beautiful and kind. The only problem is that there's no indication she'll treat him like a man. After seeing him observe her, Ayaka hugs him and starts calling him Aki-chan, which he doesn't like. He asks Ayaka not to call him that, but she insists that it's cute. She asks why, but his memories of his big sister treating him like a girl back home floods him. He can't answer, so Ayaka turns back to cooking. Though his endeavor to be seen as a man isn't looking good, he resolves not to lose hope. He decides that if he manages to make Ayaka see him as a man, then she might, you know, do the deed with him. First things first, 
he must show her that he's reliable. He approaches Ayaka, who is currently hanging clothes and offers his help. While she's happy that he'd help her, she clarifies that she'll be taking care of her things. By her things, she means her unmentionables, which Aki's holding right now. She then instructs him to take care of the sheets instead. The boy obliges. Next up, he asks to help her with the flower bed. But he trips and throws the watering can he's holding, unevenly watering the flowers. When Ayaka decides to scrub the floor, he volunteers to do it, only to end up slipping. With Ayaka asking if he's okay, he finally tells her that he has decided to be manly. Ever since he was little, his sister has been telling him he's like a girl. He came to Tokyo alone because he wants to change that about himself. Ayaka gives him a hug and comforts him. She tells him he doesn't have to strain himself and apologizes for not realizing how he felt. She promises him that from now on, she'll be calling him Akun. Aki asks her to treat him like an adult, though, and she says she'll only do it if he gives her a kiss on the cheek. But just as he's about to do this, the three other Sunohara dormers arrive. The shortest among the three is Yukimoto Yuzu. The black-haired girl is Yamanashi Sumire. And the pink-haired one is Kazami Yuri. Sumire tells him that they're all Ayaka's victims, too. Yuzu reprimands Ayaka for the scene they saw earlier. While watching, Yuri asks if Ayaka did anything strange to him. Apparently, Ayaka's incredibly touchy-feely with all of them, but especially with Yuzu. Might be because she's cute and tiny. As they talk, Ayaka proves their point and hugs Yuzu close to her humongous chesticles. Aki digests what his new doormate said, and when it fully dawns on him, the poor boy starts freaking out. After all this, Yuzu goes to Aki and tells him to cheer up. They then introduce themselves. Yuzu is Tamanachi Middle School's student council president. Sumine carries her on her shoulders, blood still on her nose. She then introduces herself as the VP. When Yuzu talks about how cool Sumine's surname is, more blood comes out her nose, making her unstable. Yuri then introduces herself as a student council secretary. Aki is relieved because Yuri seems to be normal, but little does he know that the girl is already imagining him in a maid outfit. The boy then introduces himself, which Yuzu answers with her promise to raise him well. Ayaka disputes this and takes Aki in her arms, as she should be the one taking care of all of them. Aki then asks Yuzu what she's wearing on her head. She's affronted at this. Why did he ask something like that to a person he just met? The girl laments. Aki, while confused, apologizes to Yuzu. She waves it away and leaves, clearly dodging the question. As she does, Sumine mutters that she's cute. Aki then asks the VP what's up. Subina says that Yuzu wears that in an effort to seem taller. She adds that she seems to have a complex about being small. Yuzu drinks milk every day and secretly massages her- Okay, you know, let's just stop there. And also that she realizes that she's talking to a boy. She threatens to end her new roommate as he clearly now knows too much. Fortunately for Aki, Subina doesn't succeed. Yuzu and Subina eventually need to leave. Aki looks at them and thinks that their height difference makes them look like mother and daughter. Yuri asks Aki, aren't they good together? She also tells Aki that the three of them have been together since they were little, but Sumina is not proactive, so there's no progress. Yuri asks that this is the year she'll finally get them together, so she asks him to assist her. As the three girls leave, Ayaka asks Aki if they should pick up where they left off, making Aki blush. The caretaker laughs at him, saying that she's only kidding. Is she really? In his room, Aki plants his face in his pillow as he thinks about Ayaka. She's incredibly touchy-feely with everyone, so he's not special. But still, he's so flustered that he's kicking the bed. It's now been one week since Aki arrived at the Sunahara house, and Ayaka being excessively touchy with him hasn't really changed one bit. As she's trying to wake him up, she buries him in her huge chest. Yuzu sees this. So she once again lectures Ayaka about her behavior, which is nothing new, since she's always getting lectures every day. The only difference is today is the entrance ceremony at Aki's new school. The three student council members leave early to prepare for the ceremony. Yuzu once again reminds Ayaka to not do anything just because she and Aki are left alone. As the two watch them leave, Aki remarks that they take their student work very seriously. Ayaka confirms this and adds that they've made many friends because of the student council. At this, Aki looks down. 
Aika's hug doesn't fluster him, so she becomes a bit worried. He opens up that he just charged ahead with his decision to come to Tokyo. He doesn't know anyone, let alone have any friends in this new and unfamiliar place. He worries about people making fun of him because he's from the province. Ayaka just continues clicking to him and hugging him. He asks her if she's even listening, and she moves away and tells him she has an idea. Aki has a bad feeling about her idea. Same little guy, same. She puts on her high school uniform and suggests that they practice making conversation. She asks him to pretend she's a girl in his grade. Now he thinks that if he does this well, she'll finally acknowledge him as a man. All that aside, he handles the pretend conversation well, following Ayaka's lead. Soon enough though, he's unable to keep up and says that this isn't helping. She grabs Aki's hand and lets it touch her chest, saying that her heart is pounding. He gets flustered over this and asks her what she's doing. She admits that she was kidding about being nervous. I mean, Aki's just a little kid. How could a grown woman get nervous over him? She adds that if he had that much spirit, he should do just fine. Now, Aki's heart is racing, but for a different reason, obviously. Time is flying by so fast, and soon it is time for Aki to leave for school. Ayaka assures him that he'll make lots of friends. That night, Aki shares to Ayaka that he did his self-introduction very nicely. Thanks to the practice they did that morning. He didn't get that nervous when he spoke and everyone in his class seemed very nice. She gives him the usual hug where his face gets buried in her chest. She tells him that he can come to her anytime he has a problem. It's now been one month since Aki started his new life in Tokyo. He's getting used to wearing his new uniform and walking to and from school every day. Like now, he's walking home and thinking about doing homework, while well, he still has the motivation to do so. When he opens the door, he's greeted by the sight of Ayaka in a cheerleader costume. Tokyo still has a lot of incomprehensible things, it seems like. So as he's doing his homework, Ayaka, still in her cheerleading outfit, cheers him on. She is making a bit of noise that distracts Aki, so he asks her if she's trying to cheer him up or interrupt him. And why, why, why is she wearing that cheerleading outfit in the first place? The three student council members enter Aki's room in a cheer dance formation, with Yuzu at the top of course. The student council press explains that the first large-scale event since he enrolled is coming up soon. That event is the school field day. Ah, uh, that's why Ayaka's in the cheerleading outfit. Events like that need cheerleaders after all. The caretaker shares that the outfit is originally for Sumire, but she didn't want to wear it. The image of Sumire wearing the outfit dazes Aki, which earns a hard pinch from the VP. Aki turns his thoughts to Ayaka. If she's cheering for them, then she's coming to school. In that outfit. Oh, lode. She catches his stare and raises the top part of her outfit a bit, asking him if he's interested. Interested in what's underneath or wearing the outfit himself, I don't know, because Yuzu thankfully cuts that off. Press continues with her explanation of what'll happen. Luckily, everyone on the Sunahara house is on the same team, so it's just natural that they win. And well, Yuzu's pride can't take it if they lose. She'll have Aki join the parent-child three-legged race with Ayaka. And so, the two of them have their practice for the three-legged race. First, they warm up by stretching. They then start with the actual practice. Sadly, the two have a significant height difference, so Aki finds it a bit hard to reach Ayaka's shoulder. But he doesn't care because Ayaka's warm and smells nice. They then spend the day practicing for the race, speeding it up as they get the hang of it. And because of the said height difference, Ayaka's chest is right against Aki's cheek. So once they go fast, her... Mountains bounce a bit and hit him, making him fluster. Their practice ends at dusk, and with Aki huffing and puffing. Our boy's not that athletic, huh? He then observes that Ayaka has unbelievable stamina, and doesn't seem as tired as he is. She asks him to get ready to take a bath. While Aki is taking the bath, Ayaka walks in yet again, causing him to get flustered. She says that his hair has gone long, so she thought she'd cut it for him. Couldn't you just wait after or at least before? Oh well, we're here now. He tells her she could give him a hairstyle that she thinks is nice. 
she doesn't really change much of his hairstyle. She just trimmed it short, which Aki loved. After this, she shampoos his hair. But then Ayaka started to have too much fun, making different shapes from the shampoo suds. But because she took her time, it started to get cold. So Aki is now in the tub, and Ayaka decides to join him. This, of course, flusters the boy. So he asks what the caretaker is doing. Ayaka says that this is also part of training for the three-legged race. Mm-hmm. She explains that the more in sync their breathing is, the faster they can go. And to do that, they have to be closer to each other. After that awkward bath, Aki contemplates that every day until field day, they're going to be that close with each other. And every day after that, their training to get in sync increases in intensity. They do train for the actual race, but they also do other things like play cards and sleep in the same bed. Right, sure, that's part of the training. And finally, field day arrives. But just as they're about to go to school, Aki passes out at the entrance of the dorm. Sumine remarks that the train of long-term physical and mental proximity to Ayaka must have been too great. Yuzu concludes that he's going to be useless that day. And we don't even see if they won the race. The heck? The next thing we hear is Yuzu screaming from the bath. Aki rushes over to see what's happening. And he finds Yuzu's darkers. She realizes this and gets embarrassed, telling him to give her some privacy. After she gets dressed, she tells Aki that there's a giant spider on the wall. The spider crawls out of the bath and scares Yuzu. She urges Aki to get it since he's a guy, but he replies that he doesn't want to and it's scary. She tells him he's such a wimp. Well, that makes the two of them. Yuzu shares to Aki that she dislikes bugs in general, especially when they're nearly dead and twitching. Aki teases her by pretending that there's a nearly dead bug twitching on the floor. This terrifies the poor Yuzu, and after finding out that he was just joking, she gives him a punch. At this point, the spider shows itself in front of her, and she shrieks more loudly than ever. Sumine, who just arrived, comes over to help her dear president. Yuzu ends up crying in her arms, and this gives Sumire a nosebleed. She tells her to leave this problem to her. With the coolness of a ninja, she senses the spider above her. Then, she loses all of that coolness when the spider lands on her face, and she passes out from the shock. Yuri tells them that the huntsman spiders are beneficial. They don't harm humans, so there's no need to exterminate them. She says all of this from her room, far away from them and the spider. But honestly, what she said is true. So don't kill the hunter spider, guys. As they debate on how to remove it, Aika arrives wanting to ask Aki something. Soon enough, the spider lands on her chest. It slips a bit between the valley, effectively trapping it. She calmly gets little Spidey off her chest and with her bare hands and tosses it out of the window. After waving goodbye to the spider, she then asks Aki to go out with her to do some shopping. Since it's the first time he's going out with her, he overthinks and has a hard time deciding which clothes to wear. Ah, uh, the little dude is thinking that he's gonna go out on a date with her, when really they're just gonna go out to get some groceries. The three members of the student council barge into his room and dress him up in women's clothes and says that it looks good on him. Aki resists and pretends to see another spider, hoping to scare Yuzu. It doesn't work, but Yuri remarks that she's really afraid of spiders. Yuzu protests this by saying that everyone's afraid of something. Well, except for Ayaka. Yuzu realizes that she doesn't know what the caretaker is afraid of. At that, Yuzu gives Aki a task while he's out with Ayaka. He must find out what scares her. While they are away, the three of them will prepare dinner. At the streets, Aki notices that people have been staring at them. He incorrectly assumes that people must be thinking that they're a couple, when the truth is, my dear boy, they're actually confused whether they're mother and daughter or sisters. Welp, oh well. They then stop by Yatsuho's liquor shop to buy some stuff. Remember the girl Aki asked directions from? That's her. Yatsuho mentions that Ayaka will be participating in that year's beer fest. She says that Ayaka is a pretty tough drinker. As they're out shopping together, Aki realizes that he doesn't really know much about Ayaka. Ayaka reaches for Aki's hand when they cross the street, making him blush. While walking home, Ayaka tells Aki that he's a big help today 
and that she'll find a way to thank him. Aki thinks that there's no need. As what's happening right now, them holding hands, is more than enough. When they arrive at the dorm, he reports to Yuzu that he wasn't able to find out what scares her. Yuzu tells him they're moving on to their special plan. She pulls out a videotape and tells him to see how Ayaka will react to the horror film. So Aki invites Ayaka to watch the horror film with him and she agrees. Turning off the lights, she says it will set the atmosphere. This plan doesn't work though. Why? Aki can't handle horror films. And so Ayaka ends up easing his fears away. Yuzu does not give up though and they move on to their next plan. Yuri brings out a coat, and Yuzu tells Aki to wear the coat with no clothes underneath and then open it in front of Ayaka. And I'm happy to say that he objects to this, so they proceed to another plan. As she's thinking of something scary, tears form in Sumire's eyes. She says it would be scary to be separated from Yuzu. What a simp. Yuzu tells Aki that he'll just have to ask Ayaka directly what scares her. The boy says that he doesn't want to keep doing tests on Ayaka. So she asks him if he doesn't want to know her weakness. This leads him to think that if he knew her weakness, he can protect her from whatever it is. Then he can prove himself to be manly in front of her. He excitedly leaves the room to go ask Ayaka what scares her. She realizes that that's the reason why he wanted to watch a horror film all of a sudden. So she replies that if someone she doesn't know came into her room when she's asleep, that would be scary. Indeed, it would. So then late at night, Aki creeps into Ayaka's room. After stepping into her room, he has second thoughts and decides to leave. She reaches for his hand and he ends up lying beside her. While they're together, she tells him she was putting on a brave face because he got so scared. But the truth is, horror movies scare her too. And she can't fall asleep by herself, so she tells him to take responsibility and sleep beside her. The next morning, Yuzu, Sumire, and Yuri see Aki and Ayaka sleeping next to each other. They're holding hands too. Naturally, Yuzu kicks up a fuss at the sight. One day, while hanging out in Aki's room, Yuzu asks him what he thinks about age differences in relationships. He responds that there's nothing wrong with it in his opinion. Yuzu says, But like, wouldn't a teacher and a student be too far apart? He asks her in return. Excuse me, President, but you do realize this is my room, don't you? Aki has a point. She replies that since he's uneducated, she'll give him a science lesson. Warmer air rises and cooler air sinks, and it's crazy hot for May. Their rooms are on the second floor, and his is on the first. So, you kinda get it now. He asks her why don't she just go to the kitchen or the living room, but then it sinks in for him that they're alone in his room now while sneaking glances at her. Well, sneaking is a generous term since Yuzu catches him staring. She wonders why, and mistakenly assumes that he must be interested in the shoujo manga she's reading. So the press asks, well, more like commands him, to sit next to her so they can read it together. He complies, but far away from her. So how would they read it then? She makes him go closer, but eventually her arms get tired from the angle, so she sits in between his legs. This way, her arms won't get tired. He can just find a way to see the manga. Yuzu's head is in the way though, so Aki is having a hard time reading. In the manga, a scene where the guy hugs the girl from behind makes Yuzu all flustered and blushing. She's surprisingly innocent, getting all red from these kind of things. Meanwhile, Aki wonders why she stopped reading. So he asks her if she still isn't ready to move on. The problem is, he basically whispered in her ear, so she freaks out even more. Yuzu realizes she and Aki are in the same position as the two characters from the manga. She asks herself if it looks like she's enticing him like in the manga. Still, she tries to push to move the page, but it seems like she is frozen. Impatient, Aki does it himself, which increases their points of contact. Yuzu can't bear it and has to exit the battle early. She tells him not to get any ideas, goes out of Aki's room, and runs away as fast as her legs could take her. Ayaka meets her as she's on the way to give Aki some cookies she baked. She asks Aki what happened, and he replies he has no idea. They were just reading manga, and then she decided to bolt. 
Aika decides that they should recreate the situation together, and maybe they'll understand how she felt. Aki is confused by this, so she elaborates. How were he and Yuzu seated while reading? Ah, Aki gets it now. He blushes and tells Ayaka that Yuzu was between his legs. The caretaker asks him to sit between her legs and read all he likes. Easy for her to say she's not the one getting flustered by her proximity. When she gets closer, the boy can't concentrate, so he tells them they're done. But of course, Ayaka couldn't resist hugging Aki, which is the sight that greets Yuzu when she returns to Aki's room for her manga. Which naturally, of course, earns the two scoldings from her. Hidden in the corner, Sumire watches this all unfold. Now one day, Aki feels like he's being watched the entire day. He thinks about this as he goes to the toilet. Sumire follows him inside and tells him that day she's observing him. Sumire says that lately, all Yusu talks about is him and she doesn't get it. Hence, she decided to investigate. Like what does he have that she doesn't? She starts pulling his shorts down and he struggles to keep them on. After that bit of a struggle, Aki tells Sumire that it would be easier to just ask Yuzu. She replies that Yuzu is a busy woman and asks him to remember his station. While still kneeling on the floor and catching his breath, Aki thinks that Sumire's brand of weird is way different from Yuzu's. Aki sees more of Sumire's brand of weirdness as she observes him even when he's just in his room. He tries to do his homework like usual, but he can't keep calm. Then, Sumire comes close and tells him he's been moving awkwardly for a while now. Well, of course, Sumire, how would you feel if someone was staring at you, right? She then takes a look at his homework and tells him that he got some of the parts wrong. She ends up teaching him and he's grateful for her. Aki remarks that she's pretty smart, to which she answers that of course she is. She's in the student council. Then Aki says the press is also smart? This raises Sumire's hackles faster than you can say Yuzu. After this, she goes through some of his stuff and finds a cute stuffed toy. So Sumire and Aki find a common denominator. They both like cute stuffed toys. Aki's shocked at this. Sumire figures that it doesn't fit her image, but the boy disagrees. While it's not manly, he still likes plushies, and it's cute. At this, Sumire's eyes sparkle and says, That's right! Who can help but like cute things? It's normal! Aki startles at her behavior. He's never seen her so energetic. But then Ayaka walks in on them, bringing Aki's laundry. When she sees the two, she closes the door again, not wanting to interrupt anything. Of course, they're not doing anything, but you have to understand. Ayaka's view was Sumine kneeling in front of Aki, and she was also panting. Sumine clears up that there's nothing going on between them. Things take a complete turn though when Sumire tells Ayaka that she and Aki have been bearing their shameful sides to each other. Ayaka says, Oh, you let him see too? And Aki wonders what the hell they're talking about. Sumire admits that she thinks she sees why Yuzu has taken liking to him. But before she leaves, Sumire tells him to put books of shameless nature out of Yuzu's reach. Aki of course protests that he doesn't have any. One day, Aki, Yuzu, and Yuri take a peek at Sumire who's lying flat on her stomach in her bed. She honestly looks catatonic. Aki asks Yuri how she ended up like that, and she responds that they just went to an amusement park. It was so much fun, until the incident happened. Yuzu planned to try on a ride, but unfortunately, she did not reach the height requirement. Sumire felt bad about this and thus in such low spirits. Ayaka is not at the dorm, and Sumire says she's too ashamed to face them. Yuzu asks Aki to fix the situation. He protests that it's inappropriate for a man to enter a lady's room. So Yuri and Yuzu take care of this by dressing him up as a girl. Well, with that, he enters Sumire's room. As he sees the brooding Sumire just lying in her bed, he notices that her room is very feminine and it's full of cute things. He asks her to go back to her usual self, and she replies that even if she did, she would just cause trouble for Yuzu. So he insists that if there is something he can do to help, he'll do it. She then asks him to help her get changed. This surprises him. Despite acting all shy about it, he does what she tells him to do. So after changing, Sumire laments how she didn't get to carry Yuzu on her shoulders today. She's in withdrawal, guys. Aki asks if he can be the substitute and she agrees. Carrying him on her shoulders restored her back to her usual self. She comes out of her room to apologize to two, and of course the two wave it away, with Yuzu saying that the incident won't break her. 
She also adds that Sumina didn't carry her on her shoulders today, and she misses it. Cue the nosebleed. The three student council members decide to go back to the amusement park, this time with a rooster on Yuzu's head in an attempt to reach the height requirement. However, she still can't get on the ride. Sometime later, Yuri asks a favor from Aki. He thinks that this might mean she relies on him as a man, so he tells her that he'll do it. If it's in his power, he'll do whatever she asks. A man doesn't go back on his word. So they go to Yuri's room. Aki observes and admires the girl's group picture on her table. But let's go down to business. Yuri wants him to wear a maid outfit. Now Aki somehow has to show he's manly by wearing this. She tells him that she makes costumes as a hobby, and she'd like to see how they fit. Yuzu is too small, and Sumire and Ayaka are too big. He's the only one close to costume sizes. I somehow don't believe that. The poor boy asks if she can't wear them instead. With a menacing smile, she reminds him that he would do anything. Although manipulated, he did say that after putting it on, Aki observes that it fits perfectly. I guess Yuri's imagination from episode 1 of Aki in a maid costume came true. What he doesn't know is that Yuri made it in his size from the start. To his horror, this maid outfit is just the first of many costumes that he has to try on that day. And not only this, they're doing a complete photo shoot with the costumes. And on to the last outfit, Yuri wants Aki to try on this revealing bikini. And of course, he opposes to this. She ends up chasing him and causes a ruckus in her room. Ayaka, who is downstairs, wonders what the noise is all about. So she goes to Yuri's room. Aki does not want Ayaka to see him wearing girl clothes and even having a wig on. So he hides with Yuri inside her closet. Aika does not see anyone in the room and then quickly leaves. While inside, Yuri asks him if he doesn't have any thoughts about the situation they're in. All alone? In a dark closet? Close to each other? The concept makes Aki jump out, screaming denials. Back in his room, he's still flustered. Yes, she seems nice, but still. Well, she certainly smells nice, he thinks. He remembers being close to her and gapes at the ceiling. Aki, get a grip. Meanwhile, Yuri remarks how much of a goofball Aki is. She then puts a framed photo of Aki in the maid costume beside Ayaka, Sumire, Yuzu, and Yuri's photo. I didn't get a picture of us, but at least I have everyone now, she says. Moving to the Sunahara house is bringing lots of new experiences, laughter, and chaos to Aki. Subscribe to watch more videos like this. Turn on notifications. And leave a like it really helps the channel out. Thank you for watching.